welcome everyone to the latest episode of Keto Chat. I am your host, Carol Freeman, founder of the Keto... Oh, I can't even remember what the name of my program is right now. Uh, Fast Track to Keto Success. I'm a certified nutritionist in Washington State here. Today, I'm bringing a really amazing success story with keto. Michael Wood is here. He has a really unique perspective on um, nutrition, too, background that's going to be really interesting for you guys to hear about. So, um, Michael, will you just share... Who are you? We had this discussion. We turned it on, but Mm -hmm. well, I'm a retired uh, health and wellness consultant with a large uh, national consulting firm, and I used to work with big self-insured companies in the tech space and hospitals, uh, oil and gas, financial institutions, and would help them figure out their wellness strategies and what they would provide to their employees across the board, from weight loss to smoking cessation. consumerism, uh, how to be your own doctor sometimes, uh, the whole the whole gamut. And I retired three years ago and kind of hang out, hung out my shingle to work with early stage companies. And um, at, at the same time, um, I was having uh, an eye problem mm-hmm. and, um, uh, and I had uh, a detached retina that was, that was caused by a, a, a surgery that didn't work. And so, uh, at the same time, I was talking to my dentist, uh, and he said, Michael, you know, your gums bleed too much. Mm. And um, I said, well, but I brush and I floss. And he says, well, what's your A1C? What's your blood pressure? You know, uh, what do you eat? Mm. Which is amazing that a yeah. dentist is, most doctors don't even ask that, let right. alone a, it's a ama- dentist. It, yeah. It's amazing. There's a dental practice in, in North Seattle here, and, and this periodontist has converted all the dentists in this large practice amazing. to be um, low carb. So he says, well, read this book. I said, what book? And he goes, Terry Taub's Good Calories, Bad Calories, which is, you know, this thick. Yeah, yeah. And so, but since I have a training in public health and epidemiology, mm. it was kind of like, I, I just ate it up and, and read it to cover, cover to cover and just went, wow, if I'd been doing this all wrong all my career mm. um, and telling people to do the wrong things. So studied more and more, you know, watched a lot of YouTubes. Um, and then when I had my eye problem, it was kind of like, you know, you don't want to have high blood sugar when you are trying to heal your eye. Mm-hmm. So, and I had been... Uh, Gradually, I was, I was an athlete and everything, and I gradually had been gaining weight over the years. My blood pressure crept up to 140 over 90. My A1C was 6.3. My dad was a diabetic. My mm. sister's a diabetic. So I had metabolic syndrome. Okay. And so finally when I had this eye problem, uh, I decided, okay, that's it. And I went cold turkey on July 10th, 2014. I went entirely low carb. Okay. And... Um, I couldn't exercise because of my eye condition at the time. So for the first three weeks that I was on it, I lost 10 pounds. Okay. Which just floored me. Because mm-hmm. you, you, were, you were athletic before, so you thought you right. had to exercise to lose yeah, weight, right? right? Yeah, and, and exercise is always a good thing, but it's not um, required, especially in the early goings um, mm-hmm. in, when you're eating low carb. So I lost 10 pounds, blew me away. I had tried, you know, cutting my portions, and uh, I, I even talked to a, a coaching company that was provided through my employer, and they mm. said, well, just eat more fruits and vegetables, mm. <laughs> and cut your portion sizes, and use your fist to measure how much, yeah, how yeah, big yeah. things are, and all that kind of stuff, and I tried it, and, and nothing happened, I, and I was 212 pounds okay. at the time, and so in that first, you know, month or so, I went from, from 212 to 202. And I couldn't believe it. So uh, now it's four years later. Um, my A1C dropped from 6.3 to 5.7. My triglycerides dropped from about 300 to 179. Interestingly, my cholesterol, my total cholesterol, went from 279 to 250. Okay. And my reading on this is that half of people who go low carb go up on their total cholesterol, mm-hmm. half of people go down, which means it's probably irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then um, my waist went down three inches and, um, you know, more energy and, you know, I had to buy new clothes and <laughs> all that stuff. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm down almost 30 pounds after, you know, three and a half, nearly four years now. And it's kind of like when people say, well, 
low carb or keto is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. I kind of go, right. well, it was for me, and right. I've seen you know hundreds, if not thousands, of other examples mm -hmm. out there of people who've been successful in uh, in a low carb uh, way of, of life or lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. Were you following like a low fat diet before, or roughly like that? Did yeah, kind of. I mean, it was. I wasn't. I wasn't. Um, you know, rigid about it, mm -hmm. but I, yeah, I mean, it was, I followed like everybody else, mm -hmm. you know, and followed the USDA guidelines, Eat in the Heart Association, and all this of energy, low fat, and drink skim milk, yeah. and avoid red meat, avoid red meat, all, back you on know, salt, and yeah, all that kind okay. of stuff, okay. and um, then I read, you know, Gary Tobbs, I read Nina Teichholz's book, um, the Big Fat Surprise, um, Gary's second or second book, uh, Why We Get Fat, and his third book, uh, The Case Against Sugar, um, and David Ludwig's book, I'm mm. Always Hungry, and you know dozens of, of lectures, you know, by the researchers in this field, and yeah. you know it just was amazing to me that all all of the USDA you know, Heart Association, Diabetes Association recommendations are not based on evidence. Mm and weren't based on evidence. And you're somebody who, that was your career, like looking right. at that and making recommendations. Right. Did, what was that moment like when you realized like, oh wait, these recommendations we've been making aren't based in science? Well, well it was kind of embarrassing. <laughs> and, and, and you know, I, I kind of feel the same way as Tim Noakes. Mm. I feel like apologizing to my clients that, yeah. you know, gosh, I told you all these years of, you know, low fat, Mm -hmm. whole brain goodness and all that stuff and and I was making the problem worse mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to you know right wrong and and now do some things to help spread the word that, that yeah. reducing carbohydrates and eating you know whole unprocessed foods can make a huge difference mm -hmm. in most people's lives was it an easy mental switch for you because I know a lot of people especially People that have worked in nutrition field one way or another, um, when they've been touting this, you know, low fat whole grain mm -hmm. thing for thirty or forty years, even if they read Gary's book or mm -hmm. a mountain mm -hmm. of research, that cognitive dissonance is really hard for them to wrap their brains around. It's really right. it takes a lot to, to change somebody's mind. So was mm -hmm. that a quick process for you or what was that like to Well, for me, fortunately, it was a quick process. Okay. It was you know, here's 10 seminal studies or whatever, mm -hmm. randomized trials, and then yeah. all the epidemiological evidence that Zoe Harkon has uncovered yeah. um, about, you know, the inverse relationship between total cholesterol and lifespan. You know, the mm -hmm. higher your cholesterol, the longer you live. Yeah. Wait, um, say that again. Say that again. The higher <laughs> your cholesterol is, the longer you live. That's a big, yeah. That's yeah. another thing we're working on unraveling right now. I think the yeah. low-carb approach is going to be easier to swallow than the don't worry so much about your cholesterol. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is that, that the reason low carb is also resisted is because it, it says it's okay to eat saturated mm -hmm. fats. Right. Um, because that produces satiation, ease your appetite, you're not hungry all the time, you're not yeah. always hungry, like yeah. David Ludwig says. Um, so I think part of the difficulty that people have had is, so if you go low carb, that means you're increasing your fat, your saturated fat intake. That's a bad thing. That's going to raise your cholesterol. Yeah. It's going to cause you to have a heart attack. Yeah. None of which is true. Yeah. Um, the data just don't bear that out. So, it, for me, it was relatively easy. But I, you know, I was trained as a kind of a scientist and researcher, mm -hmm. and to follow the evidence. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the evidence was contrary to everything that I had read before, it was kind of like, wow. That's amazing, and then you know I had my own end of one experiment mm -hmm. and found that it, it worked for me. Yeah. And so, but I you know but I also empathize with people who um, learn about the low carb way of eating and then have trouble with it mm -hmm. uh, because there's all this dissonance, like you said. Mm -hmm. Is oh, but wait now I can eat the cheese and I yeah. can drink full fat cream in my coffee and I can have a steak and yeah. you know and I can put butter on my my green beans that's all okay now I don't have to use margarine or anything yeah it's it's a hard switch when for mm -hmm. 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 years you've been told the opposite you know, right all of that stuff is unhealthy and and then the other thing is the toxic food environment that mm -hmm. we all live in where there's sugar everywhere mm -hmm. you go to the office supply store and at the checkout 
there's sugar. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's just, it's every, and then 80% of all the groceries that we buy have added sugar in them. So it's hard, and people are time pressed, and you know, the temptation of convenience and quick and all that type mm -hmm. of thing keeps a lot of people from cooking real food. Mm -hmm. And so it's harder to get off of it um, for a lot of people because of, of the way we do things. But interestingly, places like India, vegetarian, mm -hmm. you know, they have a higher rate of diabetes than we do. Yeah, yeah. And it's because they eat so much processed flour and and uh, sugar mm -hmm. that it causes abdominal and liver, you know, fat accumulation yeah. and they end up with diabetes. Yeah, yeah. Well, and uh, I've been listening an audio book, uh, The End to Overeating, I think is what it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll link it below. But uh, the, talking about societal norms have changed as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of contrasting in uh, parts of Europe, like France, where like you eat at mealtimes and that's all. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, he was saying the example of now where, uh, and this has even happened in my lifetime that I can recognize that, um, you know, now it's normal that people go into meetings and bring snacks with them, you know, and right. bring a drink and a mm -hmm. Starbucks, whatever, sugar coffee or something. Mm -hmm. And that's the norm is that you're always eating and there's always food available and you go to meetings and people bring food, mm -hmm. high carb foods into mm -hmm. meetings. And so it's normal now that we eat all the time mm -hmm. and that we should be eating all the time. And I've taught classes in the past where you know it's an eight-hour class and the students just they're eating the entire time because they got to keep their blood sugar up <laughs> right yeah um and so it's that's dramatically changed and uh you know i remember when i was growing up maybe it was like kindergarten had a snack in the afternoon but otherwise mm -hmm. like you didn't eat all day long um and now you think about how many cup cup holders are in cars for example because you know you got you can't go along without drinking something <laughs> right no that, that's very true um and if you think about us evolutionarily, mm -hmm. um, you know, for three million years we were hunter gatherers, and it's just logical to me that mm -hmm. that you know it was kind of feast or famine. You, yeah. You you if you made a kill, you got to eat well for a day or two, and then you probably didn't eat much for another day or two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there was none of this um, eat every three hours uh, pattern of of how we. Um, evolved mm -hmm. and so our bodies were evolved over three million years to be in this feast and famine mode not mm -hmm. to be eating every three or four hours and snacking on, on high sugar mm -hmm. high processed carbohydrate stuff which was not available until about 10,000 years ago and then even just in the last 50 60 years with with the, the new guidelines you know we went from low fat to or from, from higher fat to low fat replaced with sugar. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah. sugar in everything now. Yeah. And so sugar in bread, you know, sugar in your in your um, spaghetti sauce, um, and, and so on. And carbohydrates have just, you know, skyrocketed in our consumption. And it's, you know, it's a straight line correlation between carbohydrate intake and diabetes increase and obesity increase. And mm -hmm. so it only stands to reason that if we reduce the proportion of carbohydrates and processed foods that you know everybody will be better off. Do you fear now? Some people I know fear that we're going to swing the pendulum too far. That mm -hmm. we're going to go from low low fat to extreme high fat, mm -hmm. and that's not going to mm -hmm. be any better. Right. Like, what do you think of that? Yeah. Well, kind of one of my missions in my professional life is to find that sweet spot. I, my my trainings in public health, mm -hmm. and so I always have my public health hat on. Bell so curve, what, right? <laughs> what's what's going to work for the vast majority okay. of people? And I, I think w what we need to focus on is reduce or restrict your carbohydrate intake, mm. eat unprocessed whole real foods, and and don't worry about fat. Now you don't, you shouldn't necessarily have to you know supplement with fat mm. if you're just eating whole natural foods. If mm -hmm. you're eating a variety of types of, of fish, chicken, meats, mm -hmm. um, and vegetables, um, above ground leafy vegetables, um, that's not very, you know, radical or swing the pendulum. That's, yeah, that's yeah. just, eat, you know, natural whole foods. Um, so I, I try to help people that I talk to about this understand that it's not about, you know, eating 80% coconut oil, uh, and, and it's not about 
necessarily, I mean, there are people that do it, becoming full carnivore mm -hmm. um, and just eating meat. There are some people that do that with success, but for, again, for 80 or 90 percent of the population, I think if you're just reasonable, restrict carbohydrates, eat green leafy vegetables, protein, and the fats that come with them mm -hmm. naturally, don't be afraid of having a little bit of butter and, you know, full fat cream in your coffee, yeah. that, you know, everybody can have success. Yeah. Well, what you're describing is probably around a 60, 65% fat diet is what you're mm -hmm. describing. A whole foods fat ends up being. So, um, and it's, yeah, it's not the 90%, um, you know, a ketogenic diet has its basis in treating ch children with epilepsy. Right. And sometimes there is a place for that 90% fat, but like you're describing, the most of the population doesn't need that extreme therapeutic mm -hmm ketogenic approach right. like just a low carb approach works for most people and i think most people either can't or don't want to count food mm. they don't want it's like with calorie counting yeah calorie counting is futile um i just saw a study the other day in britain where they the men undercounted their calories by nearly a thousand calories a day okay and and women i think maybe 800 or something okay. like that and, and all you need to be off by is 21 calories a day mm, in, like order, in, or, book, in yeah. order to gain 20 pounds in a, in a decade. Okay. Nobody can be that accurate right. to 21 grams of, or 21 calories. I, I think the same with, with um, carbohydrates. I don't quote unquote count my carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. I just choose from a list of foods mm -hmm. that I know are lower in carbohydrates. And so when I choose nuts, I choose you know pecans, and macadamias um, over cashews mm -hmm. because cashews are higher in carbs. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I um, try to stay away from, you know, I don't eat grains by and large, uh, and I stay away from root vegetables and potatoes and things like that. So I just naturally, mm -hmm. I don't have to count carbs, and I think probably 90% of people don't want to count mm -hmm. what they eat. They yeah. just want to eat and enjoy their food. And as long as you kind of stick to this list of here are the good foods and here are the ones that you should avoid, it all works out. Yeah. What's it been like your family seeing you go through this? Have you converted some people along the way, fr friends and family? or? Yeah. Um, my uh, immediate family, um, my daughter is, is largely uh, low carb and, and so is my wife. Um, my son lives in New York. I'm not quite sure what he's doing. Okay. He's thin. Uh, like I was when I was his age, um, but uh, uh, but you know I've got other relatives who are even diabetic and mm. and they're unable to um, change. And mm. it's one of my kind of um, questions: is how do we deal with this issue of the, of carbohydrate addiction? Yeah, yeah. Because you know most people, like I was lucky. I'm probably in the one to five percent who can go cold turkey. Mm -hmm. There's most most people, you know, they love bread. Yeah. <laughs> they, love, they love potatoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I have a, a, a really good friend who told me, he says, you know, I lost 100 pounds on a low carb diet 10 or 15 years ago, but I can't not eat rice. Mm -hmm. I have to eat rice. Mm -hmm. And um, so, how do you break through that addiction? Yeah. Um, I had a, another friend who is a mountain climber and a weightlifter. And, he was eating two cups of quinoa a day. He thought he was, well, he was yeah. virtuous. Right, because you know, that's it's, protein it's rich. It's protein <laughs> and an ancient grain and all this. Well, when he stopped eating two cups of quinoa a day, he dropped 15 pounds. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, the, but the whole idea of addiction, I think, we've not done a very thorough job yet of, mm. of addressing. It's kind of like once we, with tobacco, once we recognized that tobacco was an addiction, then we were able to develop strategies and tactics that, that help people more effectively quit. I'm hoping we can do the same thing with, with low carb is that, you know, most people are addicted. Mm -hmm. I was addicted yeah. you know, to different, you know, things. I love bread and um, things like that. But um, now I just find pleasure in other, other mm -hmm. foods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask that about, um, you know, what's your perspective on, you know, cheats and treats? Like, do you, mm -hmm. um, are there certain things that you really miss that are hard to resist? Or has it been pretty easy? And then... Do you ever allow yourself, mm -hmm. like, you know? Yeah, I, I, you know, we'll have a piece of, a small piece of cake and a little ice cream at the birthday party. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, like if I go to the movies and somebody else buys some popcorn, I'll go through handfuls of popcorn, that type of thing. But 
It's what I do day in and day out mm -hmm. that's more important. It's kind of over a 30 day or 60 day period. I generally eat, I've kind of estimated I probably eat somewhere between 30 and 50 grams of carbs a day mm -hmm. at the most. Yeah. I mean, there are some days when I'm under, I'm under 20 when, mm -hmm. I have, when I know all I've eaten is meat and, and vegetables mm -hmm. and eggs and cheese. And, you know, I know I'm under 20. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, I'm not um, rigid. Mm -hmm. about it and like if I go out to dinner for a nice celebratory dinner and they bring some sourdough bread you know I'll slather a bunch of you know butter on and have have a small piece of sourdough mm -hmm. bread yeah I don't you know I don't treat it like poison okay um, but I just can't do that every meal yeah. which most people do most mm -hmm. people if you look at a typical American breakfast oh, it's yeah. oatmeal or cereal you know toast even if it's whole wheat which is just as bad as white um, and orange juice and it's like mm -hmm. blood sugar skyrocket. Yeah, yeah. And and so it's more about what you do all day, every day for you know a month or two at a time, as opposed yeah. to well, you had a piece of cake, or yeah. you had a brownie, yeah. or you had a potato. Yeah. yeah. Well, and and people like you, and there's a percentage of the population that can do that. And um, I I found that longer that people stick with a low carb or keto approach, they end up with being able to do, you know, dabble in that once in a while and mm -hmm. not spiral out of control, whereas right. there's still a lot of the people, like you, you were talking about, people with carbohydrate addiction, a lot of them that I work with, that that's a very slippery slope for them. They have a yeah. hard time ever controlling that. Um, but I have also found that people that historically, that they there was always that slippery slope where they could never have a little bit. Um, if they stuck with, with keto long-term enough, I've seen that they can, they can start to experiment a little bit with like, mm -hmm noticing what works for them and what doesn't mm -hmm. and they end up having kind of that that gap instead of like a compulsion they actually can make choices mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and but it varies from person to, to person as you probably recognize yeah. that but yeah and i have got kind of gotten to the point where um if i eat something with a lot of carbohydrate in it sometimes i'll have i'll kind of go that really wasn't worth it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it doesn't taste that good. It's, it's a part of the learning, right? Like, yeah. I don't like feeling like that anymore, so... Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, I haven't had heartburn in mm. three and a half years. Mm. And um, at one point, I used to think about which pizza topping is giving me heartburn. Mm. Okay, okay. And it wasn't the topping. <laughs> it wasn't the topping. It was the dough. <laughs> Um, so, or like, um, if I would have my regular oatmeal breakfast or, and let's say it's a Saturday or Sunday and I, you know, go sit and watch TV or read the paper and fall asleep again, mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes I'd wake up with a sour stomach. Okay. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Now I know. You now know. you don't even need the nap afterwards either. No, right? <laughs> and, and, and if I eat, when my typical breakfast is some eggs, either fried or in an omelet, and some sort of breakfast meat, mm -hmm. um, I never have an upset stomach and I usually don't eat lunch because of that. So mm -hmm. I, I've actually kind of taken to some intermittent fasting mm -hmm. just naturally, yeah. not as a conscious strategy, but if I have a big breakfast, I don't feel like eating until maybe three or four o'clock and then oftentimes what I'll do is I'll just eat a few pecans mm -hmm. that I've roasted in ghee and salt and um, have a few pecans and that tides me over till supper. Yeah. Or, yeah. or I'll have supper and then I'll skip breakfast and mm -hmm. have breakfast at lunch. Yeah, okay. Um, and I think that's one of the ways I broke through when I kind of hit a plateau of, you know, my weight and was able to drop another seven, eight pounds, mm. you know, by doing intermittent fasting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Longer gaps of the insulin exposure. Right. right. Yeah. 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 So I think the whole idea of individualization is really important. Mm -hmm. I think that not everybody out there can do what I did or how I did it or how I'm doing it. Yeah. Everybody, you know, has different degrees of addiction to different foods. Mm -hmm. Everybody has different schedules and family obligations mm -hmm. and, and budgets and all that type of thing. So, um, I think it needs to be personalized. So, you know, the keto and low carb coaches and that are out there, I think are beginning to understand that more and more as it is not a one size fits all, but Still, the principles are the same. Restrict your carbohydrates. Yeah. Don't be afraid of fat. You know, eat adequate protein. Mm -hmm. And and you're not going to be as hungry, and you're going to lose weight, and you're going to hopefully reverse your diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Oh man, I had more ideas, but questions, but then I'm like listening so intently. Well, let me. I yeah. mentioned diabetes. I, you know, there's a a couple of new companies. Um, Heal Clinics and yeah. Verta Health, are, okay. I think, are very exciting yeah. uh, new companies that are 
reversing diabetes and helping people lose weight at the same time. And these are these are medically run clinics, right? So it's right. not just some fringe person that's doing this. Right. This these is, are MD yeah. supervised um, weight loss and diabetes reversal. And if you, if a person follows the the regular American Diabetes Association diet and medications and all that stuff, nobody ever reverses their diabetes. Right, right. They just maintain their blood sugar at between six and seven or so. Mm -hmm. And, um, but they still end up with amputations and mm -hmm. heart attacks and kidney failure. Yeah. Whereas this new approach is, you know, restricting carbohydrates and supporting people. Um, our, people are getting off their insulin, they're getting off their, you know, uh, additional medications, you know, these hugely expensive medications that you see on TV commercials all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're going, you know, to near zero medications, including mm -hmm. off blood pressure medications. It's yeah. all medically supervised. Yeah. Um, and and so, you know, Verda just published their results and they were, I think they got a 60% success rate in the first year. You know, Hugh Clinics has a track 60, record. 60% of reversing diabetes, right? Yeah. Their, okay. Right, yeah. yeah. And, and the other 40% didn't reverse diabetes because they couldn't or wouldn't or weren't able to follow okay. the recommended um, eating style. It'd be interesting then to look at the success rate of everyone who followed protocol. Like imagine it's like 95%. It, it's over 95% because yeah, yeah. Eric Westman and uh, his clinic at Duke has shown that over the last 10 years yeah. that, that if you stick with a diet, mm -hmm. you know, you're 95% of the time going to be successful. Yeah, 95%. If you follow the diet, 95% of people yeah. are reversing diabetes. There's there's no medication. They always joke at the conferences, if there was a pill that could do this. <laughs> it would be worth trillions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so ultimately what I understand Eric's clinic has shown is that if you take a 1,000 people mm -hmm. who go in and enroll in his clinic, after uh, two or three years, about half of them are still on the diet mm. and still off their medications. Yeah, yeah. Or redu greatly reduced medications. Yeah, yeah. So if we had a pill. Yeah, even that rate, right? If we had a pill that was 50% effective, it would be a miracle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, you know, there's all the money in, in pharmaceuticals and, you know, big food and mm -hmm. all that, that that push keeping things as they are. Let's let's go down that path. What do you in your ex your you know your training and experience in the past? Like, what do you see happening over the next forty or fifty years? Um, well, I, I think as we recognize that that we are um, over consuming simple mm -hmm. carbohydrates, um, I, I think I mean if you think about the low fat movement, mm -hmm. the low fat movement got started you know around 1970, 71 with the McGovern Commission. Mm -hmm. um, here we are nearly 50 years later, and everybody thinks low fat's the way to right, go. Right, right, exactly, yeah. So, so I have hope that, that we can flip that, and, and people will say, well, you know, low carb is the way to mm -hmm. go. And, and then there's evidence mm -hmm. that's documenting the impacts being positive. So um, it, it, we're like, you take smoking, you know, in the, in the 60s or 50s, everybody smoked, mm -hmm. you know, it was everywhere. And, and nobody could understand why you would want to restrict it or anything like that. And here we are now, and, you know, who, who would have ever predicted that the, the Irish and the English would ban smoking from their bars and mm -hmm. their pubs? Mm -hmm. You know, you know that just never, or the French from their restaurants. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just never believe that that could ever have happened. So, so I think, and I'm hopeful it's going to take a while, and hopefully it won't take as long as it did for tobacco to kind of, be understood yeah. because we have the internet, mm -hmm. free communication around yeah. the world, yeah. the ideas can be spread, the research can be done and disseminated <clears throat> and hopefully it won't take 10 years for the research papers to disseminate and, and yeah. be put into practice like in the past pre-internet days. My, yeah. my fear, so I, I, can, I can see that happening much more quickly like mm -hmm. you said too because of the internet and things mm -hmm. like that and we've already got research that supports it. I remember mm -hmm. when I was in school. Um, so we're filming this in 2018. Back in 2004 is when the A to Z diet study came out. Mm -hmm. I was in school, it was probably about, um, I would say 2009 or 2010, where uh, you know, I'm in my micronutrients class with my professor and whatever pro uh, project I'm doing, I, pu I pull up that study. I find mm -hmm. that A to Z study. So it compared um, Atkins diet, <clears throat> what was it, Ornish and then Zone. It was basically yeah. like a low carb, a moderate carb, and a very low fat diet. Mm -hmm. It compared all those, and I think, was there four or three? And anyways, so across the board, the Atkins diet had the greatest health improvements of all markers they looked at, 
Plus then um, at follow-up, people could, even when they stopped the diet they were on in the study, the people that had followed the Atkins diet kept the weight off the longest mm -hmm. and retained the most health benefits from it. So I remember showing my professor at that time, like, have you seen this study? Like, right. and uh, she says, yeah, we just, we don't even, it's such a head scratcher. We just don't even understand why that, yeah. why that came out like that. So the research has been there, but it's been like swept under the rug as, as an anomaly. Like that yeah. was that, we don't know why that happened. So um, I, I, I think, you know, we do have research and I think that's going to happen a lot sooner. My fear though, is that um, because the food manufacturers are already starting to jump on the bandwagon, my fear is that this all can, be um we can lose the goodness of it if all of a sudden we just switch to highly processed high fat um you know high fat low carb like artificially sweetened right. foods that are full of like you know pseudo yeah. food chemicals, chemicals and things like that yeah. because people will overeat those and you know if you're over consuming calories and fats you still may not or probably not going to get most of the health benefits that people are getting right. when they're eating real whole foods right so yeah. that's my fear is that we're going to mm -hmm. people are going to jump on the you know the processed food bandwagon of keto and then not really get mm -hmm. any or low carb and not getting got get many health benefits and just say like well that was another diet that didn't work so that's yeah. my fear yeah no and I, I relate to that um i see some of these kind of keto friendly products coming mm -hmm. out yeah. and you know bars and drinks and shakes and mm -hmm. you know and exogenous ketone you know additives yeah. and all this thing and that's one of the things I've kind of been trying to sort out it's like my wife said well I, I thought you thought you know eat, doing the, the bulletproof coffee was a good thing and I said well it's not a bad thing necessarily but it's just yeah. it's mainly added calories yeah and empty calories right um, yeah. at that so I've kind of again coming back to my public health hat mm -hmm. is you know eat restrict calorie restrict carbohydrates eat whole unprocessed foods so I don't buy you know the bars mm -hmm. and and the shakes um, I don't even make keto desserts mm. um, I my my dessert every night is one or two squares of, of 70 to 85 percent dark chocolate mm. and that's enough to satisfy me mm -hmm. with my coffee with with heavy whipping cream yeah so I, I think we've got to we've got to get back to kind of just eating real food mm -hmm. and um, being a little bit more judicious or planning planful with our time um but you know some people like recipes some people don't I, mm -hmm. i'm not particularly into the recipe thing and trying to make the perfect keto bread um i just kind of eat the vegetables and the meat and the fish and the cheese and the eggs and mm -hmm. that's fine for me but mm -hmm. for you you might be really get into keto brownies or whatever it is <laughs> um but you know the whole idea of big food getting into this it, it, it is concerning, mm -hmm. and um, they're not they're going to do what what sells, mm -hmm. not necessarily what's healthful. Right, right. Yeah. I do like the current trend that we're seeing, where you know the drink the beverage companies are jumping on the bandwagon of like unsweetened flavored mm -hmm. sparkling waters. We've got a lot of choices of that. I think that is mm -hmm. a very safe route to go down. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but as we start, yeah, get other. Foods and things like that. One, one encouraging thing I learned at this low carb Breckenridge conference last week uh, there's a little hospital in West Virginia with like 50 beds or something. Mm. They're the first hospital in the country to outlaw sodas and junk food in their vending machines. That's awesome, yeah. And so um, that was really encouraging. Yeah. Uh, and, and amazing at the same time that hospitals still serve and, and provide junk food as a part of their meals, you know, they have Cokes and orange juice and, you know, um, Jello and all, all these things and their vending machines are full of, you know, very sugary sweet things. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's contributing to the bad health and, and obesity and diabetes of mm -hmm. both the patients and their visitors and, yeah. and the staff. Yeah, yeah. So that was an encouraging sign. Hopefully there'll be some other mm -hmm. hospitals that follow suit. Well, I, and I, on the same page as you, whereas I, you know, keto dessert is something I occasionally will make, not something I like to have every day. Like, mm -hmm. first of all, I don't like the way that it makes me feel because it still feels like kind of empty calories. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I don't like the feeling of, 
Like most of the time, I'm not hungry anymore. I'm not obsessed with food. I don't even think about food. I like that freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and eating those things just makes me, it's like it calls out to me like, hey, there's some leftover whatever in the fridge. You should go have some of that. And I don't like that, like mm -hmm. food being in control of me. And so I only make those things occasionally. I'm like you, like keep the food really simple. It's really delicious. I eat, I'm satisfied, and then I can go mm -hmm. on with the rest of my life and not mm -hmm. constantly thinking about food. So, which is a big change for me because I came from before of like, gourmet uh you know i would say i'm not a chef because i'm not working in restaurants but home cook mm -hmm. and teaching cooking classes and spending all day planning and, and preparing meals and now it's just so much it's so much more freedom i just enjoy it so much oh, more. I, I, I did too and and i didn't realize until i'd been eating low carb for quite some time how much i kind of subconsciously mm. viewed food as a reward mm-hmm mm -hmm and as opposed to fuel mm. and, and i kind of learned this from a, a fellow scuba diver on a boat i was with this russian guy um he just kind of go get a plate full of stuff to eat and he says food's just fuel yeah yeah and um i i don't go that far but 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 that's kind of the attitude that i was taking is i'll enjoy it it's wonderful i mean there's nothing better than a you know a nice juicy hamburger with some cheddar cheese on it and you know a salad and some broccoli with some butter mm -hmm. and you know it's great and it's delicious and I and I love it but um, I, I'm not thinking during the day oh I did that so now I get a snack or yeah, yeah, yeah. or um, you know I really feel like a big sandwich or something like mm -hmm. that for lunch it just doesn't even enter my mind anymore or you've you know? been so good on your diet for a few days you deserve a treat yeah. or something right <laughs> right right yeah that whole psychology has changed because I've lost my appetite if you will mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I'm usually only hungry twice a day. Mm. Um, not everybody can do that, mm. but that, again, back to individualization. But if you eat a big breakfast, big monster breakfast, most people don't need to eat lunch. You know, yeah. I, I mean, it's only four hours away. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I'm still feeling full. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's yeah. such a difference of, um, you know, I was certainly there. It was like, if I went two hours without food before. Like, I was just not doing well. Like, I was always having to plan about where I was going to stop to eat and bring food with me and all that kind of stuff. It's just crazy making. Well, that's because you were eating high carb, yes, right? Yes, yeah. So oh, you, yeah, you yeah. eat some carb. Like, one thing, I used to eat oatmeal um, in the, at, like, say, 7 in the morning. Mm. By 9 o'clock, I'm starving. Yeah, yeah. And because I had the sugar bounce mm -hmm. and, and, sh and as healthy as oatmeal has been portrayed to be, yeah, yeah. it's got a big glycemic load. Mm -hmm. And then you crash, and then you're, you're hungry, and you want to eat. Mm -hmm. more carbs yeah yeah so it's a vicious circle yeah um, well i'm wondering um what what work do you think needs to be done like mm -hmm. any different like whether it's personal people watching the healthcare mm -hmm. community whether it's i don't know who like what what work do you see that needs to be done so that we can improve as many people's yeah. lives as we can well i think one thing is that everybody can feel as though they have the permission to do an n equals one experiment on mm. themselves try it mm -hmm. try it for a week or two yeah see what happens now if, you, if you're really strict keto the first two weeks you can have some side effects mm -hmm. um, some people call it a keto headache I never happen to have one mm -hmm. um, some people have a little trouble with the regularity and all that but um, once you get kind of beyond that two weeks um, people find that they feel better mm -hmm. they have more mental clarity in the first two weeks, they oftentimes lose a few pounds. Mm -hmm. uh, first month, they usually usually more than that. Mm -hmm. um, so just be okay. I mean, and, and what's dangerous about eating vegetables, meat, fish, chicken? I mean, what's dangerous? I, about I know it's so funny because I've had <laughs> I've had like parents that I work with that are, and they're like, oh, can my kids eat this way? And I said, well. Um, meat and vegetables and a little butter like what about that would be dangerous for your kids to eat and they're like oh okay yeah that yeah. makes sense <laughs> yeah right so do your own experiments um for those of you who are so inclined there's there's 70 some now randomized controlled trials that have been published and you can find them uh on the dietdoctor.com or um i think even in wikipedia mm. lists all the different randomized trials that show that Low carb is superior to any other diets or ways of eating uh, for weight loss. And Seventy studies, right? <laughs> Randomized controlled trials. Yeah. Um, and then uh, when it comes to policy, uh, you know, if we can all support our schools 
our hospitals, our public institutions um, to change and, and look at the evidence and, and use the, the actual medical evidence that shows that if we reduce our carbohydrate intake and improve and increase our kind of use of, of whole foods Ooh. that we'll all get better. How and would the schools be like with, with yeah. healthy low carb foods in the schools? Oh man. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, for those of you who haven't seen it, I encourage you to watch Fed Up, which, okay. which is a movie about school nutrition and obesity in schools and kids. It's really sad in a way because these poor kids are exercising their butts off and still gaining weight. Mm -hmm. And you look at what they're eating at lunch, it's, you know, this one girl who's a swimmer, you know, she just kind of shrugs and says, I'll have a hamburger and french fries. Mm -hmm. And um, that's just contributing, you know, it's a vicious circle. Yeah. Because, yeah. She's, because between the hamburger bun and the sugar and the ketchup and the french fries with the vegetable oil, um, you know, she's just going backwards. Yeah. If she yeah. just ate, had ate the meat and the cheese and had a salad, mm -hmm. maybe two, even two patties, yeah. have at it. Yeah. She'd probably start losing weight. Mm -hmm. And they just point out, they interview a variety of scientists in this. But that's a nice. If you want to understand what, what the schools are doing, because mm -hmm. they have sponsors mm -hmm. and you know fast food companies that are in there three and four and five even five days a week. So that's, I, I think, another thing that, that you can do. And then read and watch videos. I mean, read Nina Teicholz's book. Yeah. Um, if you can read the that. Big Fat Surprise. Big Fat Surprise. And if you can come out of that and, and, and think that eating a low-fat diet is healthier, I, I can't imagine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, or Gary Todd's new book, um, A Case Against Sh Sugar, which he, where he argues that if he, if he ran a trial and put sugar on trial for being the cause of the diabetes and obesity epidemic, he thinks that it would be a conviction. Mm. Um, it's hard to prove, but the preponderance of evidence. Mm. So read, you know, watch some videos. You just go on YouTube and type in low carb or um, keto diets or, mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, Diet Doctor is a great um, website too. Um, so I think just everybody, if they could just kind of be open-minded about it mm -hmm. and, and try some things and, and support low-carb wherever they can, I think that can help push things along. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Great. Well, um, anything else that you wanted to talk about or you wanted to share? Or? No, I think we've kind of covered the waterfront. It's, um, I mean, my philosophy is make it work for you, mm. individualize, just, you know, broad guidelines of eat fewer carbs, eat real food, uh, don't be afraid of eating some fat, and mm -hmm. stay away from vegetable oil. Yeah, yeah. That's a whole other uh, health topic that has a, nothing to do with low carb or anything, but mm -hmm. that's a kind of a, a, I, an area that um, hopefully we can move to next as we get to people healthier and healthier, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's some evidence that, that vegetable oil increases in our diet in the last 50 years that have gone along with the carb increase, yeah. maybe made it worse. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, so I have one closing question for you. Uh, the meteor's coming to the planet today. Mm -hmm. We're all going to get completely wiped out. Mm -hmm. uh, what's going to be your final meal? Oh, man. Probably <laughs> a T-bone steak and uh, a nice salad with blue cheese dressing and probably some green beans with butter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Sounds delicious. Yeah. Nice. All right. And then the, year, the rest of the day to go and enjoy the rest of the, the site of the meteor coming. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Michael, thank you so much for being here and sharing your story. And I think you really have an uh, important perspective because of the, the work you've done in the past and mm -hmm. your own experience. And that's what I see universally is that when the doubters are out there and they just try for themselves, that is what convinces everybody that, like, I feel so great and so healthy. Like, okay, let's keep going with this. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for sharing your story with Thanks everybody. Thanks for having me. Yeah. yeah, so if you guys like this, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to see more. We've got more great interviews coming at you. Um, thanks for watching, everyone. That's all for me.